SMEF and, uh, and the Hyde's group uh, working together on their presentation. And then we want to have an open discussion. We want to hear from you your questions, your thoughts, your reactions, uh, and then we can all learn and brainstorm together. We do understand that we, we may not get to all of the questions today in the, in the 90 minute roughly time span that we have. And we've already scheduled an internal discussion among this group to be uh, the, the group from USAEDC to get together and debrief and uh, discuss whatever follow-up actions we need to take. So we'll be happy to do that. We just wanted you to make sure that you were aware of that because we, we understand this will be an ongoing discussion. And there may be other commodity groups that you want to hear from uh, in the future as well. And, and we at USAEDC can help organize that too. So before we get going with the presentations, I just wanted to share with you just one example that I, I, I found interesting, a quick little story. Just last night, US time, I had the honor of delivering a speech in Seoul, Korea, virtually, mind you, I wasn't actually in Seoul, at the US Soy Sustainability Awards Ceremony. Uh, I, gave us, uh, I gave comments, as did Caitlin Chi. She's the acting <laughs> deputy chief of mission for the US Embassy in Seoul. And uh, Minister, Ag Minister Councillor Dries was also there in attendance. We presented an award to the CEO of Latte Foods for their strong focus on sustainability, which has led them to use primarily U.S. soy in their products and to start using our sustainable U.S. soy inside logo on their packaged products. Uh, in his speech, he was very appreciative of the work that U.S. soy farmers and USEC have done in this regard. And I think it's just a great example of how this can be a differentiating factor for a wide variety of comments. Of course, I'm familiar with soy, so I use that one, but it's not limited to soy. It's many commodities that can do this kind of thing. You know, Roz, who you'll hear from in just a minute, is our regional director for that part of the world, and she gave an interesting presentation on sustainability to the audience that was there. And it was a great opportunity for us to be able to talk about sustainability. And so with, with that very high level group, we wouldn't have had that kind of discussion just a couple of years ago. Uh, or, or maybe more, but it was really uh, engaging. So I just wanted to share that. So I think the purpose of our discussion, is, as I hinted, is to share information with you and then to have a good uh, Q&A brainstorming discussion about next steps and how we really stake out the advantage that U.S. agriculture commodities have thanks to the sustainability that uh, USDA has really been driving for years and years in, uh, in the commodities that I'm familiar with. So uh, without further ado, let's uh, move forward on the agenda. We're gonna get into the presentations. And the first one will be um, from the US Soybean Export Council with uh, Abby Rennie and Roz Leak. And I'll ask them, uh, the presenters, please introduce yourself as you get ready uh, to, to start presenting. And we'll have about 10 minutes per presentation. So I'm gonna try and keep us on schedule. Thank you, over to you, Abby and Roz. Well, thanks, Jim. And you, you took part of my thunder because I was going to talk about Lote a little bit later. Um, so my name is Roz Leek. I am Senior Director of Market Access for the U.S. Soybean Export Council. And my colleague, Abby Rennie, is the Director of Sustainability. So Abby is part of the Market Access team. And it's you might say, well, why is sustainability within Market Access? Well, it very much started as a Market Access obstacle. And now we've seen it not just uh, as an obstacle, but as an opportunity. And Jim mentioned I'm regional director of Northeast Asia as well. So there, there I do have a, a slightly, uh, I have slightly two roles kind of, sort of. But at any rate, so today I have 30 minutes of presentation material to deliver in 10 minutes. So buckle your belts. Um, but I promise I'm going to keep it pretty high level. But having said that, there may be some things that you'll want to follow up with uh, us on and we would be happy to have that conversation. So first and foremost, this is not something that's going to be shocking or unique, but sustainability trends. We're hearing more and more about expectations, uh, and those are tran transforming into commitments from uh, various part members of the supply chain, and sometimes in, in, in cases we're seeing regulations starting to be developed. So this was very much the, the situation for us back in 2012. We started getting a lot of questions, particularly from Europe, about sustainability and what, you know, they, as they would ask questions, we would reflect and say, okay, well, we know how to answer that, but we need to, we need to really think about what we could put together to answer all these questions in one place. 
And as such, uh, a group of multi-stakeholders, it involved uh, farmers and NGOs and traders and importers, a, a number of folks came together and started to try and figure out how we would be able to adequately address all of these questions. From that, uh, the SSAP, the Soy Sustainability Assurance Protocol was born. And so since then, it's gone through several evolutions, which we will talk a little bit more about along with the achievements. But what is the SSAP at its very basic level? It's a scheme, and I use that because that's the European nomenclature, so you'll understand there's a lot of Europeanism in, in this because that's where much of this started. Uh, it's a scheme designed to meet the sourcing guidelines in the international marketplace. Um, underpinning it are four directives, which are really based on the US uh, regulatory uh, framework primarily, as well as some of the voluntary programs. Uh, there's a third party audit component, which again is based largely on the regulatory frameworks in the United States and conservation compliance in order to try and ensure that everything's being done um, in an environmentally friendly manner and meeting the farm bill requirements. There, it's aggregate mass balance, so we do not trace all the way back to the farm. Uh, it's not a segregation type program. It's not a book and claim program. It's a mass balance program. We do have a certification tool that allows exporters and importers to verify that the soy that's being traded is sustainable. Uniquely with the SSAP, it is only applicable to US origin products. So that provides some level of traceability as well. And then we uh, focus a lot on continuous improvement goals. So we have four continuous improvement goals based on soil erosion, land use, greenhouse gas emissions, and energy use. Some of the key achievements uh, positively benchmarked against the uh, uh, soy sourcing guidelines of the European Feed Manufacturers Association. We just got that uh, last month for their 2021 soy sourcing guidelines, which also includes conversion free requirements. Uh, we had previously been accepted under the 2015. Now to note, and we'll see uh, on the next slide, something relevant to the International Trade Center standard map, which is how the party, the independent party that uh, FIFAC utilizes in order to, uh, to conduct the benchmarking. Also have recognition by Consumer Goods Forum, Tokyo Olympic Procurement Committee, Global Seafood Alliance, uh, best Aquaculture Practices and the European Union uh, Renewable Energy Directive 1. As soon as the EU comes out with the uh, Implementing Act for the Renewable Energy Directive 2, well, we will also have that. We've gotten all the boxes checked except where they need to bring forward the final Implementing Act, which all schemes are actually in the same place. I had mentioned the ITC standards map. So we uh, pulled out Two other uh, soy, source, soy schemes that you often will hear about, Roundtable for Responsible Soy and Proterra. Now these two schemes go back to farm level information, but the RTRS is a book and claim system. Proterra is more of a segregation system, and then you have us as mass balance. And when you look at this, you think about the fact that they're going back to individual farms and that the US Soy Sustainability Assurance Protocol is a national level program we match up quite well. So we're pretty proud of this comparison um, that using the ITC standard map in order to, to demonstrate where soy stands, or where SSAP stands versus other schemes. So capturing the value, I'd mentioned the certification tool that allows for verification of uh, exports. So you know, an, an importer can request a certificate so that they then can utilize that within their supply chain in order to meet other sourcing guidelines or to uh, do some marketing and to differentiate their product to meet their corporate social responsibility. So in 2014 was the first year we offered that. And as you can see, we had a whopping 6,845 tons. As you, if you fast forward to the marketing year that was just completed, we had exported 28 million tons of soy with a certificate verifying that sustainability. In USEC, we are broken down by region. We have uh, seven regions uh, effectively. So you can see here that you've got America, South Asia, EU, MENA, Northeast Asia, Greater China, Southeast Asia, Sub-Saharan Africa. So of total exports, about 39% is going out with a verification, a certificate verifying it. But if you look at Northeast Asia, Korea and Japan, 
89% of our total shipments there have this certificate and to Europe, it is 79%. One of the other things that we offer in order to try and capture that value and Jim mentioned it in his opening remarks is the, soy, the sustainable US soy logo. And you can see there on the left is the actual soybean oil that uh, we were discussing last night with Lote Foods. But we have uh, 35 companies using this on over 850 SKUs. Many of them are consumer facing, so it might be oil or tofu, but it also is being utilized in marketing materials and, and other things. So again, another one of these things that we continue to see grow. Roz, two minutes to go. Thank you. Two minutes and 30 seconds, but no, <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> um, the, the other thing that we're often hearing about is carbon footprint. And so I wanted to quickly show some research that we've done. So this is research that we did with Blanc Consultants in the Netherlands. And this first slide that you see is the carbon footprint of US soy when you're looking at cultivation, transport to market domestically, and transport overseas compared to other origins. So you can see we do have European producers involved in this. And this is soy specifically for the European market. We have it also for uh, other parts of our regions. Now, when you include land use change, it's a pretty stark contrast. So you see that you know, we are relative, we are pretty close with Argentina without land use change. But when you look at land use change over the last 20 years and incorporate that into the carbon footprint, then suddenly, Argentina and Brazil pop very, very high, but it's also interesting to see what the land use change has been in Europe itself. So again, this is focused specifically on the European market. We do have it for other parts of the world. Um, final thing on soy is that we know when the SDGs came out, we recognized that that was quickly becoming the international uh, language for sustainability and for establishing goals. And when that happened, uh, we decided to go through the exercise to map to the SDGs, not to align, which is, has less rigor in it, but to actually map. And so we identified six SDGs that we mapped very closely to. We aligned to um, another 10. But for these six, we did actually go through that exercise and we've been able to utilize that internationally in our discussions. Finally, Every member, everybody that is on this call from the cooperator community is a member of a GBI that is called the US Sustainability Alliance. And so this is, I grabbed, did a screen grab from the website, which we will show a little bit more, but there are 21 cooperators that are part of the uh, GBI, that's the Sustainability Alliance. Here is a list of all of them. It's gone through an evolution from 2013 when it was first established to now to present day, we have organized with more of a structure in order to provide further guidance and oversight into what the activities are of the Alliance. Um, today, it is primarily done through uh, a website and some social media newsletters that as we look to the future, we're very excited about the possibility of doing more of a campaign. We think the time is right in Europe in particular to really promote US agriculture. This QR code, if I did my uh, magic, it actually will take you to the website. So we will share these presentations. And finally, and I am 30 seconds over, Jim. So this is the very last one. Um, finally, uh, what can help? I think that one thing we often hear a lot about is a more complete domestic and international uh, you know, strategy on sustainability. We get questions about what is the US doing? Where is the US going? And so I think it would be helpful to have that kind of complete US strategy. And then on measurement and data, land use change, greenhouse gas emissions, biodiversity, carbon, all of these things that USDA has a tremendous data source available to them um, and available to the public. However, it's not always very easy to be able to answer these questions. So with that, thank you very much and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Roz. Okay, uh, now we are going to shift gears and go to almonds. And I will ca I'll call on uh, Julie to uh, deliver the comments on almonds. Okay, thank you, Jim. I am trying to get my screen shared here. So hopefully you can see this. Yes. yes. Okay, great. And uh, 
sorry, I am having some computer issues, but hopefully we can get this all worked out. Uh, many thanks for the opportunity to be part of this uh, discussion today. And I think Roz gave you a great overview of some of the common issues that we're dealing with. What I'd like to do from the Amman perspective is give you a little bit of, of the history as well as what we're seeing going forward. And I wanted to start with the, the size and scope of the almond industry, because there are a couple of key issues that we've had to deal with. Um, virtually 100% of the production is in the state of California, and we have about 7,600 growers. The majority of growers are farming less than 100 acres, and that is really key because as we start talking about sustainability and practices and documentation, it starts in the orchard and getting some of these smaller growers engaged in this process can be pretty challenging. They don't actually sell into the market. They're selling to processors, handlers, who are going to be the ones marketing the almonds. Um, and we're 72% export. So that's really made it very clear. We have to be part of this ongoing sustainability conversation. Part of the way we've done that is because we are a federal marketing order, our funding comes from an assessment on every pound of almonds grown. Why that is important is that that has funded a lot of the production, environmental, food quality, and other research that has been the basis of our sustainability initiatives. And I think as we look at California almonds and what we're doing related to sustainability, we really look at this as being a fairly broad-based platform. It starts with the research and communication out to our industry members, but it's been focused largely on grower tools and self-assessments. And this, again, is because trying to get that data to be able to, to tell a compelling and convincing story starts with having data. So for us, that's really been how we um, initially looked at envisioning our program. We're now moving into more of the goal setting and more innovation as we look at, at new research. So the way we started our program, our sustainability activities really began back in 2005. And a lot of this was, again, creating grower modules, self-assessment tools that would capture information related to a variety of areas and these modules were developed with growers, researchers, farm advisors, all involved in identifying the appropriate practices. And looking at practices that reflect different production areas, soil conditions, farming systems, et cetera. Really the early part of our sustainability journey was just in generating participation and writing down some of this information. But what happened was 10 years later in 2015 with the last drought we were dealing with here in California, there was a lot of negative media. And what we found is the data we had gathered through the, uh, the program was really very compelling in telling our story and dealing with the negative media that was out there. Moving on from, from that period in 2015, we really were making a much more concerted effort in communicating out what the industry was doing. And this is where we really started looking at how do we benchmark almond industry practices against some of those global initiatives. And Roz was absolutely right. You really can tell a much more compelling story if you can put it in a common language. So we started with the Sustainable Ag Initiative and their farm sustainability assessment. And what we found is a combination of our self-assessment documentation, but combined with the regulatory environment here in the US and in California, it went a long way to showing that what we were accounting for through our program aligned quite nicely with, with SAI and their FSA. We're continuing to look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals thesis and some of these other programs that are being leveraged by uh, customers overseas. And as we've done that, I'm, I'm not going to go through all of, all of these points, but what I wanted to highlight is we've been able to leverage in talking about sustainable practices, we've been able to leverage the regulatory 
realities. So in California, you're required to, to uh, report your pesticide usage on a county level. So that data is available. But through our practices and uh, growers reporting, we know that we can talk about over 80% water efficiency through use of micro and drip irrigation systems. Uh, we've been able to see that over the last 20 years, we've been able to increase water efficiency and in fact, decrease the amount of water used per uh, pound of almonds by 33%. And we've set an internal goal to, to increase that by an additional 20% by 2025. We're also really mining our data to look at what are some of the practices that would be relevant to the ongoing conversations around carbon, healthy soils. These are all areas that we can certainly provide data on based on what's covered by our practices. But what's essential here is being able to bring the conversation around to what the practices are in California and what's relevant to the way we're growing almonds. And from that perspective, you know, I think I want to, you know, pivot a little bit and talk about some of those challenges we're facing. And obviously EU Green Deal, the uh, biodiversity strategy they have, the farm to fork strategy that's included, that's going to have some significant implications. And so we too have been looking at what are those key points that are gonna be relevant to almonds because Europe is, is one of our largest export destinations. Equally, as we look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, what we're looking at is not only the goals themselves, but what are those initiatives that align with what we're doing in almonds? And there are a number of practices that we can speak to. But what we're facing, I think, in a lot of these markets, and, and I think this is going to be common to, to all of our commodities, is that these requirements and, and sustainability conversations that are underway, all of these requirements are being pushed further and further down the supply chain. So as we look at these initiatives, it's not just about what's going to be required of a Spanish producer of almonds, but what is Europe going to require of almonds produced in California and then marketed to Europe? And that becomes a, a real concern. Data and metrics are absolutely essential and, and making sure that we actually take into consideration trade-offs. And I, I put here the front of pack labeling experience because trying to distill down priorities to color codes and numbers rarely captures the entire story, but that's what we're facing in a lot of these markets. Um, one thing that just came up today, and unfortunately it's not the, the positive story that, that Jim and Roz were, be able, were able to um, relay, but I had an importer uh, basically coming back saying, okay, it's in the German media suggesting that if you care about sustainability, you should buy Spanish almonds because they use far less water. Well, most of the Spanish production is dry farmed. It's not in really organized orchards. They have much less yield per acre. Uh, there are a number of other factors involved, but that's not coming through in these, in these conversations. So these other trade-offs are really becoming an issue. Two minutes, Julie. Thanks, Jim. Yep. We're going to be able to go back and take some of our data and help address some of those concerns that are being raised. But being able to deal with the competitor set is really problematic. And it does become a slippery slope as we get into these conversations and does open the door to potential trade barriers. I think what we're looking at and what we need is really being able to, to work together to do more to promote benchmarking and equivalence. We have to be talking about these issues with a common understanding and with common metrics. So when one commodity or one origin is talking about their eco score or their water footprint, we're looking at things the same way. Uh, I think also this element of getting credit for the government regulatory environment is really essential, especially for production in the US. So a lot of our programs are built on the fact that we already have to address certain practices. We already have to report certain information. 
but I don't know how well that's actually understood. And to that point, where we can leverage, I think, USDA data and research to support some of these metrics is really going to be a benefit to, to all of us, and I think is going to help us across all of our commodities. So with that turbo tour, Jim, I'm wrapped up. Thanks very much. Great, thank you very much, Julie. And I think there are certainly some common themes you can see between even uh, soybeans and almonds, uh, but, but certainly <clears throat> some differences as well, which is what makes this so interesting. Okay, and now we will shift and we will go to Bruce uh, Atherley uh, from uh, Cotton, Cotton Council International. Bruce, the floor is over to you. Hey, thanks, Jim. I appreciate it. And good to see everybody. Um, I'm going to share in, a, uh, in this format because it's the only thing that's working today on Zoom. So I'm going to tell you a little bit today about the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol, and I'm going to tell you why it was created, what it is, and progress to date. Just quickly, Jim, can you see the screen okay? Yes, looks good. Good. So, you know, this goes back to what Julie just said. You know, for a long time, U.S. cotton growers and the rest of U.S. ag have traditionally led the world in innovation, quality, responsible stewardship. So we have a super impressive, but a totally unknown track record. You know, these are some of the metrics that have been measured by field to market for cotton growers for the last 35 years. You can see terrific uh, impact in terms of water reduction, land use, efficiency increase, et cetera. But it's not enough is what we found. So literally we needed to create the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol for two reasons. First, virtually all of the top 100 global brands, whether that's Ikea, H&M, Levi Strauss, Gap, Ralph Lauren, you name it, created lists of sustainable raw materials, not just cotton, but leather, wool, et cetera, and committed publicly that 100% of their sourcing will come from these lists by 2025 for the most part. And despite that track record I just showed you, and despite all our government regulation, you know, U.S. cotton was not on those lists. And by not being on those lists, by 2025, we would be locked out of 15 to 20% of the world cotton market. The other thing that's been going on is regulation. In Germany, Germany created the Partnership for Sustainable Textiles. They created a list of sustainable cottons. Again, U.S. cotton not on that list. 97 German brands, little brands like, you know, Adidas, Puma, Hugo Boss, basically saying, you know, U.S. cotton would be locked out. And the ones that are on the list are things like the Better Cotton Initiative, Organic, Cotton Made in Africa. And these guys have been way ahead of us, honestly. So we needed to create the U.S. Cotton Trust Protocol because brands are demanding, you know, that our growers fill out a questionnaire on their sustainable farming practices. They commit to sustainable farming, submit their data, and submit to independent third-party verification. So it's no longer good enough to just do it. We have to prove it, document it, and verify it. You know, once you get out of the U.S., the Europeans in particular don't, you know, believe our story honestly about how rigorous USDA is and US government about sustainability. So we had to create this. And this was created about a year and three months ago. And what that protocol does is allows us to get US cotton on the list. And without being on the list, again, we would be in big trouble. Jim, you said it earlier, by the way, you said sustainability you know, is the key word everywhere now. So for cotton, it's sustainability and traceability. That's all these brands want to talk about with us. So again, launched in September of 2020, the purpose statements have set a new standard. And by the way, we don't trash anybody else's you know, program. We're happy to work with anybody else's sustainable program because we're all trying to drive toward better outcomes for the planet. But we want to set a new standard to drive more sustainable U.S. cotton production by leveraging science-based, farm-level, measurement, 
and quantifiable, verifiable goals and a real commitment to transparency and continuous improvement. And again, for us, one of the things that's popped up is not just sustainability, but labor practices. You know, I'm sure all of you have read about, you know, Xinjiang and the Uyghurs, and actually the measure just passed the House, I think, today or yesterday, and it'll go to the president's desk. So, you know, 85% of China's cotton comes out of the Xinjiang region, okay? So that has been a huge, you know, impetus to brands and governments wanting to get more sustainable cotton and cotton-free, of course, labor practices. So our value proposition is all about verified environmental data, traceability across supply chains, and then again, sustainability and transparency that, you know, you can trust. So our growers fill out a questionnaire with about 120 questions talking about different aspects of sustainable farming. They submit their data through the field to market field print calculator, which I know some of you also use on the uh, on the call. And what this allows us to do is give we are the only program in the world with quantifiable data. So not only do we have goals for 2025 US cotton reductions in water usage, soil loss, et cetera, but we can prove that we're you know, actually achieving those goals. And as I mentioned before, all our growers are subject to on-farm third-party verification, okay, from we selected control union, globally recognized to be able to do that. So again, created 15 months ago, so far we have about 300 growers in the program. Honestly, we need a lot more. We've got about 2 million bales of cotton, which represents somewhere between, you know, we'll call it 10 to 12% of all our production. We've got a goal of getting to 3 million. We've already got over 500 spinning mills enrolled because in the cotton tech supply chain, you first ship the cotton to a spinning mill, it turns into yarn, goes to fabric, dye finish, garment maker, and then comes to a brand, 45 brands over 20 countries, and we've completed just a, a ton of other work. So in terms of brand retailer members, the way it works for cotton is if you get a brand to specify in their technical pack, we'd call it, you know, so if Gap says this shirt that I'm wearing has to be made of US trust protocol cotton, the supply chain has to fall in line. And that drives demand for US cotton and drives a premium for our growers. We signed up Gap, Levi Strauss, Gildan, J. Crew, uh, not on the list. Target is on the list. We've just gotten verbal commitments in the last week from Amazon, and also from Ralph Lauren. So again, a lot of interest. And again, as I mentioned, over 500 mill manufacturer members. And by the way, all these people have to pay money to join the protocol. We just released on November 15th the first uh, inaugural annual report. It's a 96 page document. There's a 50 page supplement that has all the data from the trust protocol growers, all their practices, their greenhouse gas usage, energy usage, et cetera. And it shows how we compare to the 2015 benchmark and then how we can going to you know, achieve our goals, how we compare against our goals going forward. So. It's a really terrific document. I'm glad to share it you know, on a confidential basis. I, this is public, but then the brand piece, the 50 piece is just for members and that is also confidential. So the whole deal with this is basically you know, to increase demand for US cotton. And also, Julie, you mentioned this and you're dead on. You know, the thing that the German government minutes, created Bruce. is a non-tariff trade barrier, okay? And again, the money that we get from uh, FAS allows us to develop this program and overcome those kind of issues. So with that, thank you. The website is trustuscotton.org if you'd like more information. And with that, I am under time. <laughs> you are, good job, Bruce. Well, thank you. That's uh, very interesting and, and great to see your uh, U.S. Cotton Trust protocol coming to life in that way. That's wonderful. 
Okay, now we will move on and we will uh, have, uh, this is sort of the tag team presentation. We have them both listed there, U.S. Meat Export Federation and Leather and Hide Council of America. I think Cheyenne McIndaffer is going to start us off from USMEF and then Steve will also, I'll, uh, also be presenting. So over to you, Cheyenne and Steve. All right, thanks and share my screen here. Are you guys seeing presenter mode? Looks good. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. I'm going to start my timer too, but keep me on time, Jim. All right. Well, thanks for having USMEF here today. As mentioned, my name is Cheyenne McIndeffer. I cover export services and market access for everywhere in the world besides Asia and the Middle East. So happy to chat with you today. So talk a little bit about how we work in this space because we are a bit different from many of the other cooperators in USADC and also what you're hearing on the call today in that USMEF does not do any sustainability research, goal, set, goal setting, uh, standard creation ourselves. So we rely heavily on content produced by our other checkoff partners like the National Pork Board, uh, National Cattlemen's Beef, Beef, Beef Association, American Lamb, uh, NAMI's doing work in this space on the, the protein pack side. So they're doing huge amounts of work, research, create infographics, et cetera. We take those, we package them up, we send them to our international offices, they translate them, they pick through what really resonates with their audience, and we really defer to them to pull out what uh, best fits their consumer concerns. So you can imagine, and we'll see a couple examples on the next two slides, that that varies whether you're in South Korea, South Africa, Colombia, et cetera. So that's really where we pull a lot of our resources from. Uh, we're also members of USSA, as was mentioned, so I won't go into that since Soy covered it. We are also the lead cooperator for another USDA GBI project, uh, which will create 40 videos specifically targeting European and UK consumer misconceptions. So these will not all be sustainability related, but we will hit the big concerns, sustainability, animal welfare, uh, large scale ag production, uh, lack of family farms, et cetera. So you can see a, a clip from our first video that's gonna be released tomorrow at the Southern US Trade Association meeting. And this is really gonna be a unique project in that all of us cooperators, we make videos highlighting our own commodities. So we have one on beef, we have one on pork, but we don't do a lot of combinations. So you can see in this still, they're talking about rice, soy, crawfish, all working together in regards to benefiting biodiversity, land use, et cetera. So we're excited to be lead on this project and continue to work with the other cooperators as well as the state regional trade groups. And then lastly, uh, as has been mentioned, you know, we don't have we don't have any sustainability requirements in the export library from a regulatory standpoint for us to export meat anywhere. We don't have any sustainability standards we have to meet to export uh, meet customer demands. But that doesn't mean that we are not very concerned about what's also coming down the line, specifically in the EU Green Deal and Farmed Pork. We've already been engaged on this. We've commented on it. We'll continue to track it forward. We will continue to push the good messaging on the US uh, livestock and meat supply chain side, but we see no place for it from a regulatory standpoint in our export library. So that's the other focus we have currently. So we have lots of examples I can share after the fact. You know, a lot of our messaging is probably similar to what other folks do. We do, we've created websites, social media, uh, videos, you can see here, uh, covering multi-species. We obviously represent all red meat, beef and pork being the biggest, uh, lamb in some of our export markets as well. Shout out to Leather, who you'll hear here in a bit, byproducts, the benefits of upcycling and producing food off land that's not arable on the ruminant side. And technical presentations. When I started MEF almost a decade ago, I mean, we maybe had one slide on sustainability when we gave kind of our, you know, core presentation of what U.S. Uh, the meat supply chain looks like. And our focus has been for the past 30 years, quality and safety. And so the fact that this year we're giving 
30 to one hour presentations talking solely on sustainability in the US meat supply chain and nothing else, I mean, really goes to show how drastically this conversation has changed. This is obviously multifaceted for us. Corn, soy, feed grains play a huge part of our story uh, based on our grain finishing model. Livestock production is huge. We know there's a big target on beef spec with methane, really highlighting what our beef, pork, and lamb producers are doing um, on their side, and then bringing in the, the uh, slaughter and meat processing component as well. We do a lot of work with FAS. We appreciate the relationship. And as you can see, we just did one with uh, FAS Madrid last month. And really trying to bring you know, the message that we're similar to a lot of other countries. And so that's what you can see what we did here with Spain. International target and messaging, you know, we're pulling from content that's really built for the domestic audience. And then we're really pulling out pieces based on common misconceptions we see. First and foremost, to, as others mentioned, is, you know, 98% of America's farms and ranches are family owned and operated. It's amazing we have to continue to say this, but I really think you know, some of these folks think a farm in Iowa is run by a guy, guy in a suit in a skyscraper in Chicago. I mean, I think it's really just our scale, our conversation on uh, big ag in the US, you know, and saying a family can run a thousand head ranch, they can run a 30,000 head feedlot. We're really hammering that message home is that we have families behind all of this at the end of the day. Deforestation will be talked about. Uh, this isn't an issue, as we know, in the U.S., but we do have concerns from a global beef consumption standpoint, you know, and any benefits Brazil and others make in this space, I, I, I see as a win for beef consumption, but we do clarify it's not an issue here in the U.S. Uh, feed grains, you know, we're lucky to have the Midwest um, and have our feed grains right next door. That obviously builds well into our grain finishing model, which is a big talking point for us for sustainability. So what we'll talk about on the competitor slide is a lot of the competitor messaging we've seen in the past few years has really phrased grass finished beef as more sustainable than grain finished beef. Uh, the data just doesn't support that purely from an emission standpoint. So we're doing better on getting the message out that grain finishing does have huge sustainability benefits, especially in regards to emissions. Um, and we don't do that again in a way that denigrates uh, other, you know, grass finishers. I'm just glad people are eating beef, uh, but we do, you know, address that misconception from a sustainability standpoint here. And then and lastly, then Canada's, Canada's doing, oh, am I still echoing or is it better? Okay. Um, Canada is doing a really good job on this, is talking about the benefits of grazing cattle production in regards to preservation and vitality of the Great Plains in North America. Uh, this is something we promote as well. One of the last remaining grasslands in the world obviously has huge untapped carbon sequestration benefits that we're still learning about. Uh, as a cattle producer myself who lives in the Great Plains, I'm very passionate about this topic. So this is messaging we put out as well, um, really bringing in, again, the three pillars of sustainability into this discussion and preservation of these areas and producing food off land that cannot be used for crops. Two minutes, okay, perfect. So uh, although it's blowing 60 to 100 miles here today in Eastern Colorado, so not a great day to be on the prairie, but typically a nice place to be. So finish up on competitor messaging. Uh, this will be my last slide. As I talked about, you know, we've really seen this conversation kind of move from saying, you know, the South Americans, Australia saying grass finished beef is more sustainable, it's more green, uh, that they're changing their tune because countries like Australia continue to increase their share of grain finished beef. Uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, I think what we saw this year with the attacks not only on beef, but on animal protein coming out of the UN Food System Summit, COP26, you can see some pictures there on the left, is that the US livestock and meat industry is really coming together and trying to keep animal protein on the plate uh, with global forces saying that it needs to be removed in the name of human health and environmental health. So I, I say this is competitor um, messaging, but we're also, kind of changing our tune to all, you know, talk about the benefits of livestock and providing livelihoods, 
you know, keeping rural America thriving in areas that don't have cropland, uh, the benefits to environmental health, et cetera. So uh, as I mentioned, the video Canada, our Canadian cattle made that guardians of grassland last year. Uh, some of that really positive messaging on the benefits of livestock to this discussion, I encourage you to check out. Uh, you wouldn't think you'd get weepy talking about the prairie, but it can get you a little teary eyed at the end. So we'll continue to keep promoting that messaging, both from a U.S. standpoint and working with um, our competitors, but also the other global livestock and meat producers there. All right, two seconds short, I think. I'll pass it to Steve. Thanks, Cheyenne. Steve? All right. Thank you, Cheyenne. Thanks, Jim. I will also share my screen. And we'll go. Okay. I assume everybody can see that. I see a beautiful uh, boat. There we go. Leather and hide. Council of there America. We <laughs> there we go. Thanks, Jim. All right. Well, obviously, uh, same. Uh, we're in the same supply chain as, as USMEF and some of our partners on the livestock and, and meat industry. So obviously this makes a lot of sense to, to follow Cheyenne's presentation. And a lot, of, a lot of those themes are the same, but let me first set a little bit of context for everybody who's not as familiar with uh, hide, skin and leather uh, industry and our exports. Um, we, we produce about 95% of the hides we produce in the country are exported uh, for leather production purposes. So we are a uh, exporting industry. And unfortunately, for the last couple of years, we've seen our export values decrease quite a bit. So uh, through the, the mid early mid 2010s, we were uh, averaging about two and a half billion dollars worth of exports each year. And then unfortunately, starting around 2014, we started to see uh, a decrease of our exports uh, all the way through last year. Now, I'm happy to report 2021 is heading back in the right direction. We're hoping that's the beginning of a new trend. But uh, obviously, something was going on here that, that we as an industry wanted to to look at and, and, and dig into a little bit further. And so what happened in 2014 that really uh, uh, hurt our industry quite a bit? Well, uh, we started being outmarketed by our competitors who primarily for, for leather purposes would be uh, synthetic materials, plastic materials. So Don Draper came along, had a really great idea. Let's stop calling uh, plastic materials plastic or pleather or any of the other kind of derogatory terms you might've heard in the past. Let's start calling it vegan leather eco leather, cruelty free leather, as you started hearing all these terms, those uh, marketing terms really started to take off. And not only did consumers respond to it, but a lot of fashion brands did too as well. So what you also started seeing was a lot of fashion brands uh, coming out with uh, different types of lines where they say this is a this is a eco conscious leather bag or an eco conscious uh, uh, eco friendly shoe. And it's because it uses a lot of these other materials. Uh, the materials themselves didn't change. They are still uh, petrochemical-based, oil-based plastics, uh, they've just been marketed in a significantly di uh, different way. And so we're taking a lot of market share away from, uh, from leather. Uh, around the same time, something uh, called the Hig Index came out and, and Bruce would, would know a lot about the Hig Index and, and some of you all might if, if you're working with cotton or wool or some of the other materials, but the Hig Index was a, a tool that was developed by a number of fashion brands and footwear brands that came together and said, okay, we want a tool for our designers that they can look at the environmental impact of various materials. So they can look at what's the environmental impact if I use PU or polyester or a synthetic material versus a natural material like leather or cotton or wool. And the way they built uh, the, the framework of this system, they relied on a lot of uh, information and data coming out of uh, the European Union um, and various groups. And, and they, they built kind of a, a system that is very heavily tilted towards those synthetic products. So uh, around that same time, the, the, a lot of the brands uh, who were looking at this and seeing terms like eco leather, vegan leather take off, also were, were given uh, these tools that that said, all right, well, leather, natural leather is one of the worst, quote unquote, uh, materials you could be using in, uh, in terms of their environmental impact. So that's what happened in that kind of 2014-15 period. And that's what we as an industry have had to uh, uh, come back and address and, and start to uh, uh, market towards. Uh, one of the first things we did, obviously, is we dug into the Hig Index, we dug into the data behind the Hig Index and uh, the framework they were utilizing to come to the conclusion that leather, and not only leather in general, but U.S. leather is one of the worst materials uh, ecologically that you could be using in the world. So once we dug into that system, we dug into the data behind it, we, we realized 
uh, not only is it uh, not correct necessarily, uh, incomplete, uh, doesn't really truly reflect the US industry, uh, but it also adopts a lot of European models that have been developed through products environmental footprinting uh, process, you know, programs that the EU has undertaken. Many of you all might be familiar with those. Adopted a lot of those um, uh, frameworks, just copied and pasted them from the EU to the US to South America to other uh, other other regions, and it really didn't make sense because our, our systems are are quite a bit different in terms of uh, the outcomes that you're going to have uh, if you try to uh, use those lenses and look at U.S. systems. So uh, we saw we found a lot of flaws uh, with this data and with this system, and it's now something that we are as an industry trying to focus on to get our score back in line with uh, where it should be in, in terms of competitive basis and and bring our uh, uh, bring our value back to the market. So what does this look like? Well, uh, first of all, we have, uh, like the other cooperators, we have started marketing our sustainability credentials. So in the leather industry, we focus quite a bit on uh, the byproduct nature of a hide. Uh, as long as humans are eating uh, or, or drinking dairy or beef or any other sort of animal protein, we are going to have hides and skins created. That is part of the process. It's the wrapper that the meat shows up in. So we focus a lot on a, a user lose it kind of uh, message of, this is incredibly wasteful if you allow perfectly good hides, perfectly good leather to be sent to a landfill, which is often uh, where they are sent if, if not utilized. So uh, an example of that, we estimated last year about 4.8 million US hides did not make it into the leather supply chain, probably ended up in a landfill or some sort of uh, incinerator. Uh, we focus on slow style. It's uh, kind of an emerging trend called slow style, sustainable style. So focusing on buying better and, and holding for longer. So this is kind of the anti-fast fashion uh, model that you hear a lot about that fast fashion model is driven a lot by those synthetic materials you know buy it throw it away uh, a lot of brands and retailers uh, might be associated with those types of models so we focus on leather as being a slow fashion model that you can buy one handbag and hold on to it for generation you know for, for decades and then hand it off to the next generation um, same with, with footwear and other uh, materials like that uh, we developed many of you all know we use atp funds to develop the choose real leather campaign um, and using that campaign, not only do we highlight the benefits of leather as a material itself, but what we've started doing is incorporating a lot of those same messages that Cheyenne highlighted from our partners in the Beef Board and, and some of the other parts of the industry to uh, push the, the, the sustainability messaging of uh, cattle production, of leather production, and why, uh, why you should be utilizing these materials, why, it, why the, these materials are not having the negative impact on the, on the environment that uh, you might have heard uh, from from some social media outlets. Um, and we're trying to change the conversation a little bit too around hides. Uh, it talks about that byproduct nature of the hide. So we talk about how, how much CO2 has been sequestered into that hide that we could keep in that hide if we turn it into leather, utilize it in leather, as opposed to sending it to the landfill, letting it rot and, and, and releasing it. So trying to change a lot of that, the conversations around the material um, and using our Choose Real Leather campaign as kind of the, the vehicle for doing so. And finally, one of, one of the major projects we've undertaken, it was a GBI project that we submitted along with uh, USMEF, uh, Beef Board, uh, North American Meat Institute, it's been mentioned, is a, a GBI for this year for uh, it's farm to fashion is what we're calling it. But basically what it is, is pulling in uh, all those LCA, all the LCA work, all the uh, all the work, all the various nodes in the supply chain are doing already on sustainability and pulling them into one uh, primary uh, outlet so that we can then use it for our leather pr production purposes kind of at the end of the supply chain. So uh, we're gonna be pulling in all of the same data that everybody else has been mentioning, but just trying to, to aggregate it into one central location. Obviously we're gonna be working closely with all of the partners mentioned. We don't wanna be reinventing any wheels. So very much re relying on the other cooperators and the other organizations in this supply chain and, and what they're doing, but just pulling it forward for our purposes. So we're pretty excited about that program. Really hoping that'll help uh, address kind of that HIG index, uh, lack of uh, uh, lack of data available. So Jim, uh, with that, I saw the two minutes, I'm, I'm, I'm done. So uh, uh, thank wow. you all for the, again for the time. Okay, great. Thank you, Steve. Again, another very interesting presentation. That's great. Thank you so much. Okay, and now we are going to go uh, uh, the, the last of our presentations, but certainly not the least, uh, Rose Braden from the Softwood Export Council. Rose, the floor is Thank yours. You. Um, okay, I'll go into slide mode. Thank you very much for um, 
assembling today. I appreciate, appreciate the opportunity to talk about what we're doing in the sustainability uh, space. Um, the Softwood Export Council is a bit different from some of the other FAS cooperators in that we are an association made up of nonprofit associations, um, universities, lumber grading associations, and others. We work together to conduct research, uh, conduct education activities, and work on codes and standards and marketing events to um, promote the use and uh, facilitate open access of US softwood products around the world. So um, when Mark Slupak told us to get out in front of the sustainability message in July, um, we ramped up our efforts a bit, but we're actually quite excited about um, the world's attention increasingly focusing on making choices um, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And US forest products have always been a sustainable renewable uh, materials choice. So we feel like this is a message we've already been promoting and educating end users about. So we're happy that uh, the rest of the world is kind of catching up in some sense. Um, and whether the ambitious commitments made at the UN climate change conference in Glasgow come to fruition, the fact remains that people in the public and private sector are making decisions about material choices um, based on carbon emissions and renewability. Um, I'm gonna, sorry, my screen, there we go. Um, so we've already been positioning ourselves in that space, but we compete not only against other global wood product suppliers, the forest products industry also competes with non-wood building materials. And we've focused, focused a lot of our efforts there. Is, so the, the carbon benefits of using wood products as opposed to concrete or steel are a huge selling point for wood products. Um, a number of studies support, including the graphic, one of the graphics on the side there is uh, from one of the studies that supports that wood products perform much better compared to steel and concrete across the board, everywhere from embodied energy, which is the energy used to produce the product, to waste, air pollution, water pollution, greenhouse gas emissions, and resource and water use. So we are working to get that point out there. So for this reason, sustainability has always been a key message to our forest products um, promotion work. Um, we, our key messages include the U.S. forest products industry's environmental stewardship record, um, that all forests in the U.S. Uh, follow federal and state laws and regulations in addition to best management practices. The U.S. has its own certification system, the Sustainable Forest Initiative, and that we use to communicate our sustainability to um, in relation to Forest Stewardships Council and PEFC, two European and global certification systems. Um, we also um, talk about the carbon benefits of using sustainably grown wood products. I do say sustainably because as I mentioned, we're competing with other producers who don't always have sustainable practices in place. And we also, um, focus on the renewability and recyclability of US wood products and wood products in general. The feeling is, is all rising water or rising tides lift all boats. We take that perspective as we wanna promote the use of wood overall and US wood as well. Um, so as I mentioned, our members include university and other uh, associations such as the American Wood Council. They conduct research about carbon benefits, sustainability, replanting. We also um, rely heavily on US Forest Service data. Um, so we, you know, we could, as somebody mentioned earlier, we're gonna hit with the, the 10,000 foot view on, on this discussion. But so we have a lot of in-depth analysis of carbon benefits and sustainability US forests. Yet we often focus, or SEC often focuses on very simple, impactful messages to address the misconceptions about US forests and the use of forest products in general. One of those is that cutting trees is bad. It's not always bad. It can be very good for the environment. Um, so one of our ads to the left that we run on in international publications is that every two minutes, US forests grow 700 cubic meters of wood, which is enough to build a 12 story building that helps people kind of frame uh, a concrete thought of, of what 
how fast we're growing wood. Um, and a few key facts. So we have more trees today than we did 100 years ago, and we're planting 1 billion seedlings in the US every year. Um, another important is the, uh, the building aspect. So buildings generate nearly 40% of our annual G uh, global CO2 emissions. And of that, concrete, steel, and aluminum are responsible for 23%. It's a huge number. At the same time, wood products are a carbon sink. So not only as the tree is growing, does it absorb and store carbon from the atmosphere, but after a tree is felled and it's produced into lumber, furniture, engineered wood products, it stores 50% of its dry weight. So removing the water content, half of the, the material weight is carbon for its life. And then once, um, once the building ends its usable life, you can recycle it and goes back into the environment. So I think this is a really impactful statement is that a five story wood building stores enough carbon to be the equivalent of 2,300 cars, annual greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so how do we communicate this message about uh, US forest sustainability? So we are constantly participating in seminars. We have um, global offices participating with FAS in seminars about sustainability, as well as grading seminars um, for wood, wood products grades, um, end uses, et cetera. Um, we work with our partners on life cycle analysis research at the University of Washington. They've been doing quite a bit of that. There's the Council for Renewable Industrial Materials and the Center for International Trade and in Forest Products. We utilize a lot of their research and put that into fact sheets, videos, seminars, et cetera. We also have a YouTube channel. You can see on the upper right, our sustainability video that's avail available in four different languages. Um, we have a sustainability webpage. All of these uh, underlines are hyperlinks to the actual um, video or webpage. So we have a sustainability website on SEC's site, as well as American Softwoods, which is our international brand with Southern Forest Products Association, APA, the Engineer Wood Association. So those are links to a host of other information. A lot of them are to our uh, members of sustainability pages as well. Published articles in international publications. I just finished an article about US forest sustainability that will appear in Panels and Furniture Asia and in the Softwood Buyer News. And then this is key. Um, American Wood Council um, participates in the ISO Circular Economy Committee, which is a new committee that designates uh, recyclable, renewable materials. They've been lobbying hard to include wood on that list. And it's been a really um, an uphill battle, but they've made some really significant successes. And we're looking at, we've been working with Foreign Ag Service to um, enable them to host the next ISO circular economy meeting in the US, which would help, as we all know, hosting the meeting in your own country does help position you to um, hopefully have some positive lobbying experience. Um, we also actively participate in International Wood Products Sustainability Conferences. We are actively involved in the Mass Timber Conference, which is coming up in April 2022. And in the forest products and construction space, Mass Timber is um, a very exciting- Two minutes, Rose. Hmm? Two minutes. Okay. Very exciting new product, cross-laminated timber. It enables um, builders to create um, multi-story and high-rise wood buildings. And their climate and carbon sinks is a, are, is a central part of that. And then finally, um, we're doing market development work to create both production in the Pacific Northwest and a market in Japan. Um, we meet feed-in tariff restriction requirements in Japan um, based on US forest sustainability. Oops. Finally, work remaining. How do we elevate uh, wood products to the international um, discussion on sustainability? Um, we are addressing how do we address the idea that cutting trees is bad, when in fact we, we feel that it is not. Um, addressing misinformation. So for example, the US is leading on some of the leading international lists about deforestation, but what that doesn't take into consideration is that in the United States, um, there's a lot of plantations 
So it's reported as deforestation and then planting separately, not together. And then also making sustainability a priority in price sensitive or emerging markets like Mexico, India, Pakistan. Price is key, sustainability is less important. And then finally, I mentioned addressing competition between um, varying forest certification systems, which system is considered better than the other. And so that is, are the, is the end of my remarks. Thank you. Super, thank you very much, Rose. Well, I, I, uh, I don't know about everyone else involved here, but I have certainly learned quite a lot here. And there are certainly similarities between all these different commodities we talked about, but a lot of uh, unique things as well. So we've got about 20 minutes time remaining, uh, thanks to our presenters. Uh, now, we, as, as promised, we'd like to open it up for questions, ideas, thoughts. Um, please don't be shy. And I know this group, you're not shy. So uh, who'd like to kick it off? Hey Jim, this is Jason Huffmeister. I, I can uh, Hi, Jason. I can go first. Just first, thanks to you for uh, and Lorena for organizing this and uh, presenting it, and thanks to each of the organizations for making good, concise uh, uh, presentations. It's very helpful. We're thinking about this issue a lot. Um, you know, it's clearly had important promotion and policy implications for us in the past and we expect it just to grow in importance so uh, i'm not an expert on these things i just think about them um so i'm glad for the chance to be educated and i look for, i will be trying to learn more but i'll share one or two thoughts with you one is um is the beauty contest element of this and I could tell even from the information that was presented that you all are recognizing, people are evaluating us and trying to say, you know, how, how good are you doing? How are you doing relative to other countries? How well are you doing relative to some fixed external reference point? And, uh, you know, I think of this in two ways. One is how much have we improved? And there was lots of information on that today. Uh, and um, a second one is that how, how do we relate to some sort of fixed standard? And I think about that in part because I know retailers are looking for these kinds of improvements to tout. And I know and I expect as we get more into policy discussions, uh, governments are going to be making commitments about uh, both relative and absolute standards. And what I'm particularly thinking about, because I have less experience on the promotion side, is on the policy side, as we're going to have to start defending what we're doing by comparing it to some standard. And we're also going to have to start being prepared to talk about what future standard we might hit, either a relative improvement or how do we, uh, how do we stack up against other countries, or thirdly, how, how close to we are meeting a standard like zero emission. So, uh, so that's, I've already tried thinking about that and we're looking into some of that stuff internally. Um, so that's just a observation for me that uh, as we talk more, that's something that'll be interesting. And then the second observation uh, will be, how do we stand up these broader sustainability measures to address climate in particular? You know, the secretary is very keen to set up markets that will reward producers who have climate positive outcomes. Um, we are already seeing the European Union coming up with climate specific policy objectives. Uh, and so all sustainability is important, but my suspicion is, is that the climate part could really take off on us. And so I'm just, one of the things we'll want to know is how these platforms that you all have developed can really emphasize climate elements. So no specific questions, but uh, just two observations from what my thinking has been. And thanks again for the, the presentations. Great, thanks, Jason. It's very good to hear your kind of, uh, for, for, you know, for your, your, your view from, uh, from a high overarching level and your uh, kind of the, the watch outs that we should be considering and thinking about. Um, hey, no hey, Jim, this is Daniel. Hello, good Daniel. afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing? Great. Good. Um, no, thanks for this. I mean, this is absolutely fascinating. Um, you know, 
some of us, uh, embarrassingly so, probably didn't start paying a lot of attention to this stuff until uh, earlier this year when the new administration came in and highlighted climate change and sustainability as a priority. Um, I've had the opportunity to come out and visit uh, a number of uh, some of your annual meetings and conferences. And the one thing, the, the word that I will share with all of you is uh, education. I have learned so much about many of the efforts that you all already have underway. And I think this just kind of um, synthesizes a lot of that into a nice, uh, concise package. So uh, my first ask is, can you all share the PowerPoint presentations um, for, our, uh, for our use? Uh, and then just going a little bit broader, just kind of a, a discussion type of topic. Um, you know, I did get a chance to kind of go out to uh, Kansas City for the National Farm Broadcasters. I uh, had a great day out there. A lot of, uh, I know some of you were out there, uh, met a lot of good people, uh, met a lot of farmers and ranchers and uh, growers. Uh, and so obviously the, the, the topic of climate change came up, the topic of sustainability came up. And I guess I'd been in DC a little too long because I wasn't expecting um, uh, to be questioned as, as, as much about the, um, the, the prioritization of climate change I was. I didn't expect people to be uh, uh, as hesitant as I encountered. So my question to Jim and, and others, how do you all uh, message and how do you all communicate with some of your members, some of your producer groups and growers that may not be fully on board that this is the way to go? Um, because you know, I, I just came across some folks that you know were clear to me, and maybe it was because I was a uh, what they called a federal rally. Uh, they didn't want to let me know if they were fully on board, but I uh, did encounter some some those who are yet to be convinced. So, what's your messaging on that? And Julie, specifically, a question for you. Uh, one comment I received is, "You guys are going to try to turn us into one big California, right?" So. How have you guys sort of, you mentioned the regulatory environment that you've successfully navigated in California. Do you have any messaging for some of the naysayers that are concerned about uh, th those regulatory requirements and if they were to show up uh, more on a national basis? Well, thanks for those two questions, Daniel. Let's, uh, does, uh, do any of my colleagues on the, on, the, on the, in the meeting want to talk about the first question, how do we message? Any of the commodity people that want to jump in with that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll just. Hey, Steve. Yeah, I'll just I'll start real quick, Danny. Thanks, thanks for the that question. And my my answer is, uh, I certainly have had that in the leather industry, that kind of skepticism from the, the membership, and frankly, the, the market reality um, um, changed a lot of minds. And and I I do think that's going to be the case for a number of other commodities. Uh, you know, whether it's in the near future or, or further out, but the market reality of what's happened to leather over the last four or five years in this space uh, has, has opened up a lot of eyes. So that's, that's definitely changed. Anybody else on that one? I, I would jump in and add, uh, Danny, yeah, please. Uh, as, as recently as the uh, last week, the United Soybean Board meeting, there were farmers, uh, you know, expressing skepticism about mm -hmm whether sustainability is anything anybody cares about or why should we be open to being transparent or those kind of things. Right. I think when people see the reality and when they hear about how many companies around the world, I mean, you have to be sort of living under a rock tonight, understand that this is important. So right. I, I think we need to express the importance of it, but mm -hmm. also to talk about how the U.S. is a leader in this area. This is an mm -hmm. opportunity to promote a competitive advantage that the U.S. has and that mm -hmm. the farmers are responsible for. So they shouldn't feel like somebody's going to punish them because mm -hmm. generally they're doing a very good job in this area. It's about packaging that up and protecting them so they aren't, you know, so they aren't harmed by this, but really looking at it as being an advantage. That, yep, that's no. how we try to message it. No, no, yeah, yeah. very helpful, very helpful. And and yeah, I, the secretary has a, a, a similar message that, you know, uh, I think many of us have latched on to that follows that that tagline. Okay. Uh, Can Bruce? I add one thing, Jim? Sure. So Please. it's, Dan, you put your uh, finger right on it. I'll be perfectly honest with you. We are having some difficulty getting 
large, uh, a lot of growers, you know, to sign up for the protocol because while all the things, you know, we message about what's going on with brands and with governments, you know, for our growers, and it doesn't matter, I don't think what they grow, you know, what they look at is what's their bottom line. Look at all the regulations I have to follow now. You're asking me to do one more thing. And they say, show me the money. Mm -hmm. Where's mm -hmm. what, where can I, how can I get more money for my sustainably grown Again, I don't know about the other crops, but where's my money? So right. uh, honestly, you know, generating a premium for, you know, U.S. ag because of our superior sustainability and climate change efforts, it's, it can't be just a, uh, there's got to be something in it for the grower besides feeling good about it. You know, market access is part of it. We talked about mm -hmm. that. But the second part of it is if we can offer them any kind of, you know, in, incentives from a money standpoint, whether that's through grants, you know, from government or whether that's market forces, that ultimately is what's going to drive our growers to sign. Good, good. Maybe to, uh, yeah, please. Yeah, maybe to add a little bit. And, and Bruce, you, you went kind of exactly where I was going to go too. I think with, with our growers, you know, one of the big, big challenges is producing in California is not cheap. When you look at the cost of resources, we've had, you know, God knows how many water issues. Uh, you have now uh, not only regulatory issues, but we've had price impacts. And growers generally don't get paid to participate in a lot of these sustainability programs. And that's also because our customers in Europe generally do not pay for these sustainability programs. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. as that starts to happen, um, it's something that is kind of, I think from a customer perspective, it's going the way of food safety. It's just assumed mm -hmm. that you're mm -hmm. going to have this in place. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a it becomes a real challenge for, for growers. And we're actually going through um, a big re reassessment ourselves right now to look at how do we build in that ROI for the grower to participate. Mm -hmm. And some mm -hmm. of it is a matter of looking at benchmarking, what are you already doing? How do you get credit for what you're already doing and those practices that are in place? Mm -hmm. That's been a, a big part of it. And I think um, trying to tell the story so it's not just a matter of you have to comply with this, but we're trying to show customers, show regulators what we're already doing and, right. and how that should be recognized. You know, I, th I think the payment part of it, we're looking at things like, um, incentive programs. So you've got a lot of conservation land programs. You've got, you know, other incentives that may be out there that could work for growers. Maybe if they're mm -hmm. completing these sustainability uh, self-assessments and reporting out practices, could that put them in a better position for, for certain loans or, or other programs that are being encouraged? So, you know, I think we're trying to look at what we can do so growers don't feel penalized to to comply with this next what some of them see is the right. next flavor of the month and that's right. that's right. the real challenge right no no this is all very very helpful uh to me for us um I, you know i think the usd approach will be um uh, usda wide it'll be it'll encompass a number of different agencies obviously we're not the agency uh, with field offices and, and, and that we do a lot of the domestic work, but I think that's going to be such a critical part of this whole effort. So the FSAs, the NRCSs, the rural developments are going to be a very key arm of USDA with the messaging, with the contacts, with the producers and uh, getting all of this right. So thank you all, all very much for that. Jim, may I, may I add something? So. Please. We don't do domestic policy, mm -hmm. but once upon, a, once upon a time I did. I mean, mm -hmm. I think the farm bill needs to be modernized to address these things. We've got mm -hmm. to change the way the farm bill is done and it will help address some of these issues. If you do, I mean, I don't wanna suggest we go down the cap route, but you mm -hmm. can go down the cap route. You can still meet your obligations under the WTO and do your subsidies, but we need, we need farm bill reform. So that's not Roz speaking as USEC, that's more of me speaking uh, from mm -hmm. a, 
a former foreign policy person. But I, I think, you know, another opportunity we have is that we need to demonstrate our sustainability, not tell people we're sustainable. I think that's a really key differentiator. And I think it's important that we have the data to back it up. We benchmark ourselves against standards. Jason hit the nail on the head. We have this patchwork of standards. There's a lot of discussion about should there be a global trading standard that's involved in this, particularly for soy. Maybe there should be. I mean, I I don't know. What does that look like? Mm -hmm. If we really want to drive change, we can't continue to just do this in a -a whack-a-mole way. It has to truly be something we're all in together on. So, I mean, I think there's a lot of I think we're at an inflection point and we're going to have to think about this stuff differently. And we're mm-hmm. going to have to think about foreign policy differently. We're going to have to think about trading differently. And, and so I think we have a lot of challenges, but opportunities ahead. Very good. No, Very thank good. you. Okay. We've got just a few minutes left. Any other uh, questions, comments from the floor? or screen as it is. I have a comment, Jim, unless there's other yeah. questions. Don't see any, Cheyenne, please go ahead. So just to back up to Jason's question on, you know, both from a policy and a promotion standpoint abroad, and I think this is happening domestically as well, right? Like the guys doing cover crops are saying, I've been doing this, you're gonna pay me because I've been doing this or just going forward. And so, you know, on the beef and pork side, we are already so sustainable in many areas that we cannot make huge changes. When you look at, say, compared to beef producers in Eastern Africa, probably a lot of beef producers in South America. So we we didn't have good data behind us. We continue to get better LCAs going forward to show that. But I think that's going to be a challenge for a lot of U.S. ag commodities is we're already so efficient in producing so much that are we gonna get credit because we're not gonna make huge changes because we're already here and other you know, markets will be able to take a lot of credit by saying, oh, you know, I decreased this much going forward. So really having the data behind us to go back, establish that baseline, show how sustainable we are across various metrics and then highlight that going forward. This is gonna to continue to be a challenge for us because Our line's only going to go so much further where other countries can drastically decrease. So I think that's going to be, you know, how do we communicate that? How does our government communicate that as we see these global discussions happening and get credit for what we've all been doing for the past 50 years? I think that's a great point, Cheyenne. And I I think it's uh, something that is consistent across all of the commodities that were represented here today. And another a tool that will help us as we try to do that is data. And I think I heard several different people talking about the need for data and the opportunity for USDA to help be a resource. And uh, you know, the, I, I hear the term competent authority, to re- but to really be a, the, the, you know, the voice of uh, the data. So I think that's an opportunity and hopefully something that, uh, that people take away from this discussion today. But we've got uh, just uh, maybe, I don't know if there's any one last question. Otherwise, uh, I am going to ask Mark Slupek, who was really one of the ones uh, who who was a driving force in pulling this together. And and we sure appreciate the opportunity to be speaking with such a great group from uh, USDA and FAS. But uh, I'm going to ask Mark to make just some closing comments, if he will. But is there any last I don't see anybody uh, putting their hand up on the mic. Uh, Jason? Sorry, I couldn't help myself. I'll I'll leave one last thought for you as an old broken down trade negotiator. Um, I I think what this, we we have a standard paradigm and I think however this turns out, and I don't know how it will, it it may follow it, which is uh, first you classify the relevant elements, then you categorize them into various types and you rank them, then you measure them, right? And then you see people starting to commit to cap what you're doing. And then you see people making commitments to reduce. And um, I see the private sector having those expectations. Uh, I see government policy moving in that direction. And so getting back to Cheyenne's point, 
have, you know, we've already, you know, so baselines matter a lot in these conversations. Um, and so we just got to be prepared for those kinds of things. So that's my, that's my thought. Yeah, excellent coaching. Um, Mr. Slupek, please. Uh, thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, so I just, I'll close with uh, just the, the, the reason that I wanted to do this so badly um, a while back was that, uh, you know, a lot of times uh, we, we, we don't separate the cooperators from other, from other uh, you know, commodity organizations. And I think it's important when we talk about some of these things that we actually identify cooperators and separate them out and listen to the cooperators talk because, um, and I'll use a group that wasn't represented here today, but you know the, the, the US Grains Council is different from the National Corn Growers Association. Uh, the National Corn Growers Association has a lot to say about a lot of the things that, that we might talk about in climate change or sustainability, but they are not the ones that are out there in the world marketing you know, the U.S. grains and their products. And um, it's important for USDA leadership once in a while to, to, to stop and listen to a cooperator talk about it because it's different. Um, it's different to, <clears throat> to take the message that the corn growers might have and to, uh, you know, uh, weaponize it and take it out in the marketplace and, and deal with the, the forces uh, that are out there. And so, you know, that's why I thought this was an important opportunity. Um, the, the, you know, I, I, I sometimes I feel like the, the marketing aspect of the, you know, the, the communication of, of the, the practices that are ongoing to the importer, to the foreign government, to the decision makers um, can get lost. And, and these are the people who these are the people who do it best. So I appreciate, Jim, um, you grabbing this uh, and, and organizing some of your colleagues across the different, uh, you know, uh, organizations uh, to, to, to share that message today. Thank you. Well, Mark, thank you for the encouragement. Thanks for the opportunity. And it, uh, I, I can't take the credit. It was all of the people who presented today. And it was Lorena who kind of worked behind the scenes to organize to, to make it all happen at, the, at this time. So thanks, everybody. I think that, uh, as I said at the beginning, I think we maybe uh, we have things to follow up on. We have some information to provide, and, uh, and this hopefully will be a catalyst for more discussions. So please feel free to reach out to us. We will share the presentations with you as, uh, as Jason asked, or as Daniel asked, I guess. But anyway, thank you all for your time today. Have a great uh, afternoon. And uh, if, if I don't talk to people, uh, is, and we're getting into this holiday season, I'm wearing my Christmas tie. Happy <laughs> holidays. Happy holidays and many thanks to y'all. Thanks, Lorena. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>